Good evening and welcome to Live from Prairie Lights. I'm Lindsay Park. Tonight we're proud to present James Magruder, who will read from his new book of linked short stories, Let Me See It. Michael Lowenthal says, James Magruder manages a neat trick of math. His tale of two cousins over two decades yield a portrait of one whole gay generation. Each trajectory builds its own drama, which makes their intersection all the more affecting. Broad and deep, witty and wistful, let Me See It is a work of subtle strength. James Magruder is a fiction writer, playwright, and translator. He is a graduate of Cornell University, where he studied, studied economics and French literature, and received a doctorate in dramaturgy and dramatic criticism from Yale School of Drama. Uh, Magruder's stories have appeared in New England Review, The Normal School, The Gettysburg Review, Bloom, Subtropics, and the anthologies Boy Crazy and New Stories from the Midwest, among others. His debut novel, Sugarless, was a Lambda Literary Award finalist and was shortlisted for the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award and the 2010 William Saroyan International Writing Prize. He worked for 15 years in show business as a playwright and dramaturg and taught translation and adaptation at the Yale School of Drama for many years. He currently teaches dramaturgy at Swarthmore College. He currently lives in Baltimore with his partner, Stephen Bolton. Please welcome James Magruder. Thank you, Lindsay, and uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be at one of the essential stops along the uh, tour for literary, you know, people who write literary fiction, everyone wants to read it, uh, Prairie lights and so I'm very happy to be here. Also a shout out to my sister who drove me here from Chicagoland and gave me the shirt off her back and ironed it. Um, so uh, I think Michael Lowenthal's blurb explained sort of the the rubric of the book and I thought among choosing the stories um, I thought I would pick Elliot Bidler's V Bohem which uh, this is Elliot one of the cousins he's this is 1981 and he's not having a great time in France. He's a French major. And um, I like to pick this one because I have a special fondness for it because those of you who are you know, young writers or writers starting out, 67 literary journals uh, rejected it um, before the New England Review took it. So it's two lessons there. One is perseverance and the other is don't send your work out too early. Um, so Elliot Bidler's, B Elliot Bidler's V Bohème. Another 20 centimes pinged into the giant clamshell. Elliot bookmarked his Zola and slid down the bedspread into a seated sulk on the rug. There were so many ways to blow Paris, he thought, as he eavesdropped on his roommate, Bruce, in the front hall, telephoning yet another actual French person. This one, Martine, needed less convincing than Béa or Poussette or Gabi to meet up later near the boulevard Raspail for an impromptu confabulation. Bruce was expert at threading his speech with casual idiomatic connectives, the eh bien, the tout à fait, the m'écoute, that mark the native speaker and are impossible to pick up a language lab. Whereas Eliot still, still sometimes forgot to say comment instead of a surly sounding quoi when he needed something repeated, which was more often than he cared to admit. Bruce used mealtimes with their host parents, Giselle and Roger Sirjon, as language practice chattering away about the pretty flowers or stern newscaster or remarkable laundry soap on the television screen while Elliot traced the JC embroidered on his napkin, as if the spirit of Jesus Christ or Jean Christophe, the black sheep surgeon, could furnish him with the one withering phrase to silence them all, plus the television. Bruce Tickle, the most fluent of the 117 students spending their junior year in Paris on the Sweetbriar program, owed his linguistic prowess to God and the war on into China. After the fall of Saigon, several loads of boat people had wound up in Asheville, North Carolina. As prayer leader for the youth ministry of his father's church, Bruce had taught the refugees English, strengthening his French and becoming fluent in Vietnamese along the way. Elliot Bidler, on the other hand, despite five years of French before he be began Cornell, had been unable to test out of the language requirement. Forced to begin at the intermediate level, he discovered he enjoyed acquiring a new set of tools. To take but one example, he delighted in grasping the difference between the relative pronouns ce que and ce qui, 
and deploying them in sentences of his own. In the fall of his sophomore year, on the same day that the American hostages were taken in Iran, his father had died of a heart attack. Je suis le fils dont le père est mort. Elliot had written this in his French notebook the next morning as he prepared to reschedule an accounting exam. Whether the odd nominative predicate in I am a son whose father has died was a way for Elliot to manage his grief is open to debate. But it nevertheless locked into his brain for all time the use of don as a more elegant choice for whose than de qui or duquel. Three days after the funeral in Cincinnati, Elliot changed his major from economics to French literature. Now five months into, the, into his year in the City of Light, Eliot's language skills put him somewhere in the lowest third of the 1980-81 Sweetbriar College cohort. Required now to live in French, he discovered that its reduced vocabulary and constrictive syntax had stripped him of nuance. Every day he woke up knowing that he would make mistakes. There were few occasions for Don at the Sirgeons. Madame and Monsieur called him Elie, an appropriate reduction, he thought. He was Ellie Mae Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies, another American rube out of her depth. Bon ben, Martine, à ce soir, Bruce said, ringing off. The slangy elongation of her name, Martine, made Elliot want to tip the bottle of black ink on the desk table between their beds. Not content with French and Vietnamese, Bruce was now taking Chinese at the Paris Trois campus. When he wasn't out cultivating that most elusive of creatures, the actual French friend, he spent his evenings filling grid paper notebooks with columns of brushstroke characters. Elliot pulled his duck boots from under the stereo console and slipped them on. He would leave before Bruce had a chance to ask him if he were free that night. Tagging along was not something Elliot Bidler did. He tucked a sweater into the waist of his overalls and reattached the straps to the bib. Going for his coat, he caught the reflection of Bruce's Bible in the mirrored closet door rather than look at the angry red knots on his face. Then he circled the salon and liberated a piece of marzipan from a box next to Madame's thumb-worn pile of royalty magazines. They could eat all they liked for breakfast and dinner, but snacks weren't part of their contract. Bruce and Elliot were Giselle Sirgent's second pair of bébé américain, and her disappointment in them was clear. How short they fell of Doug, pronounced Doug, and Leslie, the lumberjacks of 7980, who in her accounts were virtual Hemingways, always returning at dawn, reeking of women or drink. When Giselle had made them soup, she would stand a spoon upright in the tureen and dare it to fall. Those were the soups, she'd say, to satisfy Doug and Leslie's hungers. Où vas tu, Elliot? Bruce frowned, still seated in the telephone chair in the hall. They spoke only French to one another, a high commandment of the Sweetbriar program that Elliot would never, in his pride, break. Bruce had blundered early on by correcting Elliot's grammar. Now there was little they shared besides a desk and a towel rack. Elliot defiantly, che defiantly chewed the marzipan lime he had taken. Never mind the house rules, or its conceivable hazard to his skin, so smooth and tranquil back home. Not only had Paris effaced his personality, it had seeded a crop of cysts across his jaw and cheeks, raging, inexpressible sentences that hurt to the touch and resisted pharmaceutical treatment. His face was bumpy as a hand grenade. Giselle thought that his acne was a delayed reaction to his father's death. Elliot didn't have the French to tell her that she was full of shit. Je m'en vais, he replied after a dramatic swallow. He swept out of the apartment, confident that Bruce would remove the telltale paper sleeve from the candy box. Elliot was not without friends. 96 of the 117 students on the Sweetbriar program were women, and many, as bewildered and mistranslated as he was, welcomed his company. On another Saturday, he might have met Julia and Sherry and Carol and Frank Crem and a slice of the Louvre, but that particular day, having been outdone by Bruce's clamshell treasury of glittering gamines, he crossed the Marais for a trip to the Centre Pompidou instead. He registered the damp septic smell of old bricks under the north arcade of the Place des Vosges, but little else. From a distance, Elliot fancied the Centre Pompidou, with its tangle of exterior duct systems in kindergarten yellow and red and blue, a color transparency in a medical dictionary. It was like a cross-sectioned cube of his seething, purulent skin. Closer up, it looked the way he felt, raw and childish, a cultural mistake. He flashed his ID to the attendant, and the escalator carried him to the third floor library. 
After brief consideration, he chose a copy of Winesburg, Ohio, and sat down to read at the corner of a long table. Discovering American literature was another way to blow Paris, but it couldn't be helped. By January, the Pompidou Library had become a refuge for Eliot, a bibliographic taking of the waters midway between the Sergent in the 11th arrondissement and the suite of Sweetbriar classrooms in the 5th. Like a sweeping stretch of Boulevard Haussmann, the bindings on the books in the American lit aisle were uniformly gray, with white windowed titles. But between the covers were baseball diamonds, and truck depots, and town meetings, and juke joints, and wheat harvests, and the legible transgressions of legible persons. Unable to disappear into drama or poetry, Eliot spent soothing afternoons on near-canonical shorter fictions like Ethan Frome, The Ballad of the Sad Café, Lucy Gayhart, Billy Budd, Of Mice and Men, The Awakening, and, unavoidably, Daisy Miller. Eliot was able that day to overlook Sherwood Anderson's stylistic debt to Gertrude Stein, whose painstaking lexical salads he associated with his own word-by-word -word transactions among the French. He had been to many an Illinois county fair and could station himself more quickly in Winesburg's kitchen alleys than, for example, on one of Melville's convoluted quarter decks. These people I know, he thought to himself as he looked up in a pause between stories. Two tables away, a man was staring at him. Elliot flushed and resumed his reading, but was soon sneaking looks up after every page, then every paragraph. Minutes went by. Sentences started and stopped over and over. Patrons sauntered past, brushing the table with long, limp scarves, but the gaze held. Eventually, the fixity of his purpose must have struck the stranger as absurd because it grinned at Elliot obliquely, then smiled outright. Fleeing his only sanctuary would leave him to the street, so Elliot held tight to his corner of Huck's raft, as it were. The dragueur that the Sweetbriar staff had warned them against, the army of charmers infesting the American Express office and a thousand other locations were assumed to be solely interested in women, a situation that left him without tools for outwitting his arousal. Straight boys go to England their junior year, Gay boys and the unsure go to France. Stateside, Elliot had dabbled both ways, but so far in Paris, he'd felt too ugly and miserable to put himself out in any direction. The stranger wasn't oily or unkempt or Algerian. His sandy, neatly dressed hair was combed straight back. The tops of his ears were delicately pointed, like elf shoes, and the convex curves of his face were the opposite of sinister college education was a given, or why would he be cruising a library? His eyes were gray, or blue, or green, at any rate not brown, a final safety feature for the American faux naif in Oshkosh overalls and duck boots from Maine. Alpine, Elliot thought. Wood. Chocolate and cheese. Clocks. He gave in to a smile at last, whereupon the stranger stood and supported Eliot's assessment by being taller than most Gauls, a fir tree who brushed the shelves with clean, fresh branches as he slipped into the stacks. Covering his erection with Winesburg, Ohio, Eliot went to replace it on the shelf next to Go Tell It on the Mountain. He loitered in this main street tagged with his sorrows. He pitched his ears for snowshoes rounding the corner. The voice, he knew, would be as clean and clear as a Swiss train whistle. The next morning, Bruce was drawing Chinese characters in a shaft of light, liturgical in its intensity, as Elliot pretends slept on his stomach in a swirl of emerald satin bedclothes. Their tiny room held two beds. Elliot manned the giant Second Empire barge, which gleamed like a pagan altar, while Bruce had the Murphy bed, he was slender enough to recede into the wall with a mattress, should the force of one of Giselle and Roger's nocturnal rows break through the plaster and drive its way into their chamber. They were to switch sleeping stations on the 1st of February. Elliot was waiting Bruce out. Difficult to do when every stroke of the pen felt like a stab to his very full bladder. How is it possible that Elliot Bidler, 20 years old, in Paris, for God's sakes, had forgotten sex? Had anything ever been more exciting than Gérard Dupont popping the side button of his overalls and reaching inside with his paw? No belt, no button, no zipper, no prep. It was something near to rape in the best possible way. 
Had anything ever been more authentically romantic than Gérard Dupont's liquid goodbye on a stairway landing in the left bank, en se revoirant? Too jazz to be embarrassed about his French. Elliot had had to make Gérard repeat it, more slowly each time until he could piece together a literal translation. One will see each other again when. A bientôt, he'd answered at last. He had touched two fingers to the pointed peak of Gérard's left ear. Then Elliot had made the sign of the telephone. He wanted the sergent's phone to ring for him, over and over, until the chestnut trees bloomed in the boulevards. He'd come in at 4.30 in the morning, happy to have the cabbie keep the change, happy to pull a Doug and Leslie. Elliot turned onto his back and let Bruce see that his eyes were open. The scratching stopped. Et alors, où étais-tu? said Bruce, failing to muffle an accusatory tone. Elliot sensed that his roommate had not given up on the wish to know him, suspected that he was even kept close in his prayers, but so little had passed between them, or ever would, that he flirted with telling him the truth. He had been rutting for hours with his first older man in a 17th century walk-up in Saint-Germain-des-Prés. That conversation, however, would tax his French and kill the high, so he fibbed, in the plural, chez des amis. It was a bit of a dare. Would Bruce ask the rude and doubting, which friends? Bruce bit his lip and finished a column of characters while Elliot traced his hand over a lion-footed naiad on the mahogany bow. According to Giselle, the barge had been the site of Jean Christophe's teenage debauches with every slut in the neighborhood. Tu t'es bien amusé? Elliot threw aside the covers and breathed in the smell of sex on himself. Oui, he said. Beaucoup, beaucoup. Several weeks later, Bruce was captaining the boat bed while Elliot played courtesan on the left bank. Gérard Dupont's lack of a schedule signified either a lot of money or no money at all. He simply said that his time was taken up by a project literary in nature. The pair of fountain pens anchoring the stack of pages written Gérard's bold, ropey hand pleased Elliot to contemplate from the chair where he sipped coffee and listened to his swain wash up. Gérard wrote, wrote in the evening, so they met afternoons. The ritual question, on se revoir quand, popped on the fade-out clinches in the hidden courtyard off the Rue Dauphine. They went to museums devoted to small subjects, like masonry or the history of monastic life. Each of these expeditions seemed to dissolve another dulling coat of paste wax the city had pressed upon Elliot. Gérard encouraged his demands for showy kisses in unguarded rooms, and Elliot learned not to panic when Gerard crossed over velvet ropes and invited him to test pieces of brooding, feudal furniture. As the junior partner in a carnal arrangement, Elliot felt no pressure to speak. So eventually he started talking, and not as language practice. Imitating Bruce would have made him too self-conscious, but listening to Gerard comment in offhand public situations was giving him the confidence to begin to drop the ne in negative sentences, to try the impersonal en instead of je and nu, and to disdain complicated classroom tenses like the past conditional. His painstaking pour laquelle and pour laquelle became a quick pourquoi. The obligatory bonjour madame to, mer to merchants grew stronger, and he began to ask for things rather than point. Twice in history class at Clignancourt, waiting for the instructor to arrive, he made general comments to other students in his section. One of them responded, Words coming back, words to savor. Such was Elliot Bidler's Bohemia, no less distinctive for being small and particularly his. Under Gerard's alpine influence, he wasn't the dumbstruck Elie staring at his dinner or the morose bookworm pitching a pup tent in the American literature aisle at the Centre Pompidou. As his French developed a more becoming slouch, he saw more of the city and less of his shoes. His new pair of skinny plaid trousers that he'd haggled over at an open market astonished Julia and Sherry and Carolyn, as did, as did his command of the cake selection when he took them to a tiny salon de thé near the Odéon that he and Gerard liked to go to. The sex matched the courtyard of the busy street. It was quiet, detailed. Both kept their eyes open for long stretches of it. They were worth watching, Elliot thought loving the idea of being in the third person as he drifted to sleep against the smooth taffy of Gerard's chest. And I think I'll stop there. Complications ensue.
Thank you. Questions? There's some journalism students here. I understand. I read where. F. They still give them. Anyone? Questions or comments? Uh, when you were writing this book, where did you draw inspiration for all of the for all of your writing? Uh, this is a thank you. It's a very autobiographical. Uh, autobiographical. Um, I would say that each of the ten stories. I, I started fiction fairly late in my early forties, after all that time in show business, and I realized that I needed the, my first few stories were about uh, mistakes I'd made in my early 20s with older men. It was kind of like a Hardy Boy mystery series. Why did I sleep with that one? <laughs> and then I went, uh, and so they, they all start from a very odd, like I went to France. I had that crazy Christian roommate, Bruce, and that, and you know, somebody picked me up at the Beaubourg Library. But then they kind of veer off and take their own life, a uh, life of their own. And so events, events will happen that, like for example in that one, Bruce and I did speak English to each other, but in the way the story is set up, they always speak French until the climax of the story, when a simple case of gonorrhea <laughs> brings them closer together. Um, it's, it's my only story with a happy ending. Um, so is that, uh, yeah, it's aut very autobiographical and then it veers off, um, takes on its own momentum. Yes? Are, are you um, translating this in French? Mm -mm. No. I mean, it'd be great. Oh, wow. I'd love, like, foreign edition of something I wrote. <laughs> oh, and I'd, be, I'd be terrible, because writing French is the hardest thing. Oh. Reading is easy as speaking. I don't know. How many of you know, f yeah, studied French? Yeah. So uh, did any of you spend your junior year abroad or a semester? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. Of course, now I wish I were there. <laughs> yes? So, yes, there's lots of young writers in the room, so the token question of what advice do you have for them? Um, if you're writing fiction, I always tell my students, and you can't think of something to write, write something humiliating, something, sometime when you're humiliated, because it, it can both be expiatory and it also instantly gets the reader on your side. And you'll find that if you write about one thing that's humiliating, other humiliations will occur to you. Um, and then, you know, you just have to read as much as you can. You can never stop. You know, my students at University of Baltimore, some of them in their mid-twenties will say, well, how do you, you know, the, my, these sentences for what they're worth are as much like me sitting at the keyboard with a fuzzy, I think of it as a fuzzy, any of you are all too young for what a fuzzy pumper is. It's a, a Play-Doh thing where you push down the lever and the Play-Doh comes out through a die. That's what my sentences feel like. And then I do it again and again and again. Um, but that comes from, I've also had, you know, 45 to 50 years of reading just about anything I can. Um, you just can't, you know, you're not going to get it from watching television and YouTube all day, as delightful as they are. Someone else? Yes. Um, how does your background in drama and being involved in the drama community help you with your writing process or with the ideas you have about writing and such? That's a great question. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, all those years writing plays and acting as a dramaturg, which is like an editor, um, it's given me, uh, first of all, writing fiction, although it's harder, there's some things, yeah, it's harder because with theater, <sighs> You don't have to write like, oh, her beautiful chestnut curls framed her face bewitchingly. Um, that's done by the actor you cast. And those terribly boring sentences that you have to write as a fiction writer, or probably as a journalist too, like she crossed the room and opened the door, they take care of that in plays. That's blocking. It's not your business. And then like those long interior, interior thoughts that characters have in novels, you don't have to bother with that unless you write, you know. So, in a way, it's, so fiction is a lot harder because of, the, for me at least, for those things, because plays are just all dialogue. I do feel that, you know, if you read this or read my, my novel Sugarless, that 
things are very structured as a scene. I'm very kind of aware of suspense or that each section, something has to happen that makes you want to read more. Um, and again, I'm it, the kinds of, you know, I long one day to write the sentence and believe it, like several years passed, or the next summer they took up golf. I just don't, I don't believe in, I don't, I don't give myself that authority. I, you know, that seems like bogus to me. I can't know that. Or say, and I think part of the several years past is that plays are very, com generally very compressed. So my first novel only takes place over the course of four months. So, and it's like scene to scene to scene, like weekend tournament to weekend tournament. Um, that's a very long-winded answer, but I, I would say that it has given me, a, it's made me, it's easy for me to write dialogue when other like fiction writers say, how can you write dialogue? How can you write dialogue? It's so impossible, but then I think it's impossible for me to describe someone's chestnut hair or like, you know, what's, and I was thinking, God, I don't think I've ever written anything that takes place outside. I just can't do that. Describe trees in, a, in an interesting way. I just, that's like, I would never believe myself. I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, your, your books have <clears throat> connected stories. Did mm -hmm. you start that way, or did you see along the way you've been <laughs> writing several different things? You saw, oh, wait, I got a connection here. How did that, how did that evolve? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, like the first three or four stories, they're all in the center of the book, are like, why did I sleep with him narratives, both for Elliot and Tom. And then I wrote some when, like, my protagonists were younger and some later once AIDS, had, you know, the AIDS, and AIDS epidemic had come up. And they, um, reading it, um, some editors and uh, my agent suggested these are really linked. Um, because basically the protagonists were me with a different college major. You know, and one he's French lit, the other he's Renaissance studies. But we weren't fooling anybody. It was me. Um, but the problem in, when they said to link them, you know, when you link some stories, either I would have to not link them and sort of throw out three of them because they were all a little too similar, which, and I just didn't believe in my talent to write a story from the vantage point of a nine-year-old girl or a grandmother, you know, to mix it up. So I thought, well, I have to link them, but there were two things that stood in my way um, in sort of in, for making it one character. And one is that in one of the stories, it's very important that Elliot in this story gets very hairy as he grows older. And it's very important in another story that one of the, um, that the protagonist, who's now Tom, has a blue collar dad who's a butcher. So it was kind of like the butcher and the hirsute um, Elliot that made me, but so I thought, wait a second, it couldn't be brothers, but cousins, because I think a lot of gays and lesbians, we have gay or lesbian cousins, and we're either aware of it or dimly aware of it, or they can die, and then your aunt will tell you years later, oh, yeah, you know, she lived with her best friend um, uh, for 30 years. So, um, but this was the, so uh, when I put them together, uh, and then I had to write a final story, which is called, it's the title story, Let Me See It, because when you do link stores, they should sort of culminate and, you know, crest. And, um, and so I brought the cousins together and uh, wrote that story. And that, that one is actually completely made up. Um, but in retrospect, I realized that that's the two parts of me. There's a part of me that should have died in 1991 because I, I've been HIV positive since 1985. And at the time of 1992, the last story, I was down to 17 T cells. And statistically, or you know, the way they're rejecting, I'd be gone by like 94. But then I became one of those combination therapy miracles. And I realized when I was trying to put these, thinking about linking the stories, and when it was all said and done, I um, realized that uh, Elliot, I mean, it's no secret, Elliot is ailing at the end. And you can see if he's picking strangers up at Beaubourg uh, in the early 80s, he runs a risk. Uh, but Elliot is the me, is the James who should have died. And uh, Tom is the me that survived but has survivor's guilt because I wasn't an AIDS warrior, for example. I was infected, but I didn't. So it's, it's daddy issues and survivor's guilt. And that is a very long-winded answer to your question. But, and I would say any of you thinking of linking your stories, link them ahead of time. Don't do them ex post facto. You could make yourself nuts. Another question? I've managed to. Shut you all up with my. How many fiction writers? Well, I was just gonna 
I was going to ask that, I mean, I, it seems to me that a lot of fiction writers will late in life try writing plays, but very few people start out writing plays and then, and then move to fiction. Does that seem right to you? I think that's true. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Henry James' is a disastrous love affair with the theater. And um, I'm proposing a, you know, they're very, only Chekhov did both extremely right. well. Um, but again, also, but Chekhov didn't write a novel, but like, it's Chekhov and that's it. Because he's inimitable as a, as a playwright. Everyone tries, they break their head against what is Chekhovian, whereas I think like the Chekhovian story is the template for the American short story, um, for good and for ill. So yeah, but I, I think I think I think people have this idea that that plays are really easy. You know, I said they're easy because actually the cliche of oh they just start talking and you write it down is actually kind of true. Theater demands that you have to keep you interested moment to moment. I mean, you know when an audience is bored out of its gourd, they start. You hear them cough. They're rustling their programs. It's it's a really different beast. Um, yeah, so. I would say the Yeah. I think because, yeah, some of them aren't comfortable with dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. But because, and again, I think we always as writers devalue what we're actually good at. So I have the, the writer friends who can write the long interior monologues or describe the mossy, the, you know, the moss covered door at the end of, you know, I forget it. Uh, and, but I can do dialogue. But because it comes so easy to me, I think, oh, dialogue, that's just dialogue. Um, so we all have our strengths. and. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to think of the dialogue standing on its own. Yeah, right. And, you know, and then there's the moments where I can start a scene. It's like, well, I know where the scene, the fictional scene. And it's like, you write the dog, and then I have to write in the blocking, you know, where they pick up the cigarette or answer the door or gaze out the window. I mean, they're markers to, you know, but they're not fun to write. Um, anyone else? Yes. So if you're writing a lot of this book was very autobiographical, mm -hmm. how come not memoir? Oh, because then I have to be factual. Then I then they can't veer off. Um, yeah, I've thought about that. Um, yeah, and and again, it's funny. It, uh, that's closer to journalism, and I was never. I've never done. I've been a reviewer and I've done features, but I never did journalism because there was just something I could not be contained by where, why, what, how, when, you know. The, um, I just thought if I can't make it up, then I, I don't want to do it. Uh, that would feel like the worst box for me. And I think mem memoir would be the same thing because uh, I wouldn't want to make stuff up. But as a fiction writer, I have more liberty. And I protect people by. <laughs> not naming them. Um, James, are you yes. moved from this experience to write more short stories, or are you thinking of or working on a novel? Uh, I have a novel that I was working. I've been working on for seventeen years. Um, huh. so I kind of started it before I knew what I was doing, and um, it again takes place over a short period of time, and it's called Love Slaves of Helen Hadley Hall. And it's a graduate school novel, and I will have no success like marketing that, I believe. But, um, but I'd like to write more short, short stories are harder than novels, I think. I'm, I'm writing a couple of novellas about being in summer stock, and I would love to actually write. You know, I live in Baltimore, and there's this bougie gay neighborhood. Well, all cities have them. I'm not sure Iowa City has it. But like all these middle-aged queens and you know, backbiting and fighting one another and oh, we have an omelet station. I thought there should be like a John Cheever. There should be like a John Cheever type uh, describing that. But again, I'll have 10 readers and my agent will say, I can't sell this. But I, I do feel called upon because I was more, because I don't have, an, you know, my partner and I, we don't have much money. So we can only, as we're classic observers from the outside. We get invited to the brunches with the omelet stations. Um, and can, uh, but we don't host them ourselves. So, yeah, I would like to write. They're so hard, though, short stories. Um, any interest in adapting anything you've written to the stage? No. Or, you know, I'd love for somebody to pay me some money to, like, put Sugarless on the screen, but, like, I don't own a television. 
So that's kind of my statement about that particular form. Although I know there's lots of, I binge watch things sometimes, but I've not owned a television or watched anything serially for 30 years. Um, and, I, and I actually feel I don't have a visual, uh, a kind of a visual talent. So like writing a screenplay, which is mostly about what you see um, than what you say. I, I, plus I'd have to learn that program. You know, was it quick final draft? Oh my God! You know, I'm such a luddite. Be harder to learn the program. Yes. Do you have a writing schedule? Uh, the question is, do I have a writing schedule? Um, I write best in the morning, um, and the only I'd say the only ritual I do is yeah. You know, ideally, I work for say eight thirty to one or two. Um, the only thing I do is I take off my ring so that I'm beholden to nobody but myself. I don't know, that's corny, but you know, other people like, I sharpen eight pencils, and even though I don't use, I use a keyboard, I sharpen pencils, so. That's my, own, that's my only ritual, but it's the morning. Unless I'm at the end of something and I can't sleep and I have to finish it. That doesn't, I mean, we all want to be struck by, I'm just gonna write it, but no, I don't. I'm getting old, too. Or I am old, I'm not getting old. <laughs> Here's the young side, younger side. Was it difficult to know um, when you composed enough stories for this collection? And then you, I know you said you added the. Yeah, the last one. Was it there, there difficulty? Did you have to leave ones out that you? No, you know, because in the end, I've th there are ten stories in a prologue, and the prologue is taken from a published story. And of the ten, only one was not taken by a journal. I have like two others, so it's basically, it's like my 12-year MFA. Um, it's like almost every story I've written, um, and and I and you know and be, and that's the thing. It's like let me see. There's some in first person. There's some in third person. Initially, one of the stories was in second person, but that was didn't really work. But I thought if you're selling a collection of stories, you should like use more of the the toolbox. Some are written in present tense. Some in past tense. So I. So that's because some link stories, it's all, even though they're, you know, it's all first or all third. And I have, again, that's a thing from the theater. I, like for years, I couldn't get arrested in the third person because I didn't know how to do it. First person was easy because the play is like, you'd say it's a landscape of competing first person voices. They're all saying I. But the third, and again, it's, it's my problem, it's my issues with authority. I'm not in a, you know, I, I can't say what people took up golf or, I, I'm not God. I can't say several years passed. So. So uh, you, you obviously refer to a lot of other writers who are speaking for class, or, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, do I read contemporary? Um, not as much as perhaps I should. I just spent. Um, Nine months in Kampala, Uganda, um, uh, my partner and I, uh, and I spent those nine months writing and reading. And what I took along with me were the classics that I either read too soon or classics I'd never read. And then I took along some contemporary or modern writers that I'd never read. So I read the, the Bible from cover to cover and Democracy in America and the Tom books, Tom Sawyer, Tom Jones, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and, but I, like, for example, I'd never read William Kennedy because it seems so butch or something. Like, give me a nice ladies picture. Um, so William Kennedy, I'd never read Updike. Uh, and so, so, but now that I'm back in the States, we had to be airlifted once they signed the anti-gay legislation in March. Well, not airlifted, but it was like Steve and I and our two overweight cats fleeing the country. Um, I, I got back and I'm reading my, I read my friend's books. Like today, Amy Bloom's book, who's a, she's a, a friend because I, I, I met her at McDowell a bunch of years ago. Um, so I'm still catching up on my, the friends' books. That, but I will say, those of you looking for something to read, um, the four best books I read in Uganda were um, Iron Weed by William Kennedy, uh, A House for Mr. Biswas by Nepal, um, A Visit from the Goon Squad, 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually late to those. In, and so like I read Arcadia a couple months ago. Wow, that's great. And I love to visit from the Goon Squad. And then the fourth one was, oh, Angle of Repose. Again, I'd never read Stegner. He's too butch. Oh, my God, the West. Forget it. Give me a nice ladies picture. You, you're shaking your head. You don't like Angle of Repose? I love it. Oh, good, good. And Crossing to Safety is great. And yeah, but there's so much, you know, there's so many, there's such a backlog of classics. That, well, any blues stories are linked. And yeah. So, and so they may have been an influence. I would say so. And, you know, early, again, when I first met her in 2005, I had literally gone to McDowell. My, my project was, I'm going to write in the third person. And so they let me in, and, you know, she helped. Again, I have so many people, again, uh, again, no MFA in fiction, but I feel like I've had really good teachers and friends um, over the last 12 years that I've been writing. clock has stopped. I keep thinking, oh, I, let me read for another hour. <laughs> wow, we booked through, you know. Well, I could have just kept reading. Uh, if there are no more questions for James Magruder, um, the book is Let Me See It. Let's thank James Magruder. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> And, and I have one more thank you to ma make, and that's to Matt Laga, who works at a, I can't say it's a rival bookstore, but it's another bookstore in town who found Let Me See It and sort of suggested to Prairie Lights that you, they had to get me here. So thank you, Matt.